Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Good, af good day. My name is Geert Kreimer from the Decentralization Body from NEN, and we are proud to host this webinar in collaboration with ISS MGE and the Eurocode Subcommittee 7 on the topic of the numerical methods. Like last year, I'm overwhelmed to see how many people attend from all over the world. With that many people present, we need some house rules. I will show it on my screen. Please mute your microphone. Use only your screen when talking. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A and don't raise your hand. You cannot see all those hands otherwise. We don't have time to answer all your questions, but we will answer all most relevant answers, uh, questions afterwards. And uh, this webinar will be recorded so you can look it back. And the presentations and the link of the recording of the webinar will be sent afterwards. If you look at the program, yeah, we'll see a welcome from uh, Georgios Katsianis. Uh, the guidance on the micro methods in the next generation from Colin Smith, the implementation and examples of new EC7 guidance from who you, I hope I pronounced it correctly, I'm sorry. Uh, and then for the official welcome, I now hand over the word to the chair of the European Regional Technical Committee 10 of ISMGZ, Mr. Georgios Katsianis. So you can take the screen. Yeah, thank you, Gert. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes. So, yes, I would like to welcome everyone today uh, on behalf of the European Regional Technical Committee 10 on the evaluation of Eurocode 7. We are one of the European committees of the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. I would like to welcome everyone to our second uh, online event. Um, uh, organized and delivered in partnership with the Subcommittee 7 of the CENT looking after Eurocode 7 and, of course, the NEN, the Dutch uh, Standardization Institute. So I would like to thank both organizations for their help and support in delivering the lecture today. Uh, so I, ha I have been the chair of the committee for the last uh, three years or so. Uh, I'm the ground engineer discipline lead for ferrovial construction uh, in the UK, uh, currently delivering the second high-speed uh, rail line in the UK, connecting London to Birmingham. Um, so I would like to start, uh, if I may, with a very brief update on the work we have been doing as uh, ERTC 10 in the last three years or so, all the good work we have been doing. So the committee was reactivated actually in uh, September 2019 in uh, the European Conference in Iceland. And for the next year or so, all the way up, uh, up until September 2020, we had a huge uh, recruitment drive. We managed to completely uh, renew the membership and fully reactivate the committee. Now we have 24 members from 16 different countries across Europe. So many of them are from the younger generation. They are from uh, the industries or they are the people that who will actually use eventually the second generation of Eurocon 7. We have established uh, quarterly meetings and we have built very strong relationships with the uh, uh, since Subcommittee 7, with the chair of Subcommittee 7, Adrian Van Setters, regularly attending our meetings. In September 21, we um, uh, hosted our first online lecture on second generation of Europe on 7, improvements and challenges, uh, which far exceeded uh, our expectations with uh, more than 600 registrations from around the world. So we set the bar too high for, for today's event. And, but the aim of that lecture was to encourage, of course, geotechnical engineering professionals across Europe and the whole world to engage with the European, uh, with the Eurocode 7 experts from the subcommittee 7, uh, the people that they are, they're actually preparing the draft of the next generation of the code and learn firsthand about the upcoming changes and the challenges. Um, this side of the year from January 22, the committee, we have been updating the terms of reference and our main objectives are the dissemination of information about Europe 7 and the changes uh, introduced in the second generation. That's what we're doing today, actually. Providing guidance and recommendations related to the application of Europe 7 in practice, in practical geotechnical design. Uh, assistance with organization and participation in, in conferences, European and international and uh, any related activities, workshops, uh, etc., publications related to evaluation and application of Eurocode 7. 
And finally, of course, to provide the link between the ISSMG, academia, industry, standardization bodies like NEN, to foster this uh, development and the, the implementation of Europe 7 for years to come. Um, in May 22, I, I had the honor to represent the committee in the International Conference uh, in Sydney, um, where we had a, a series of meetings, discussions with the wider uh, ISSMG community, representatives from industry, but also academia, and trying to raise the profile of the committee and strengthen those links with the, the international geotechnical community. And moving forward, what, what we want to do is to develop a, a much closer relationship with the TC205, which is the Committee on the Safety and Serviceability, because they also have an interest in Europos, although it's an, an international committee. And one of the ideas that we pursue currently is a parallel workshop in the next international conference in Vienna, uh, along with exploring, of course, uh, other forms of collaboration. Now, before we start with the presentations about Europe 7, um, I would like to pay tribute to some key individuals, some brilliant engineers, that they had a huge contribution to the whole Europe 7 project from the 80s until now. Uh, without these people devoting their time and their brains, there wouldn't be Europe 7 and we wouldn't be here today discussing about a new generation of Europe 7. So we, we, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And I would like to start with Neil Krebs Hobson, of course, who was the first uh, chair of the subcommittee seven, with Brian Simpson, uh, Eric Farrell and Trevor Orr. They were long-standing members of the subcommittee seven representing uh, UK and Ireland, uh, respectively. Actually, Trevor, special thanks to Trevor because Trevor was the chair of the uh, ERTC-10 uh, for, for many years, was the previous chair. So he did a fantastic job in, uh, in, in chairing the committee for, for a number of years. And Brian Simpson, of course, I have worked uh, closely with Brian for a number of years. He has uh, also a special interest in numerical methods. Um, a big thanks to, to Andrew Bond, of course. He was the previous chair of the subcommittee seven. He, he oversaw very successfully the work of the evolution groups of the Europe 7, the 14 evolution groups, uh, which is all the work that paved the ground now for the project teams to finalize and prepare the draft of the second generation of the Euro Code 7. I would like to mention also uh, Adrian Lees. Adrian Lees uh, was the chair of the Evolution Group uh, 4 on numerical methods. And um, if you are interested, uh, I would like to refer you to his publication in the European uh, Conference on Numerical Methods in Euro Code 7, which provides a good, a good overview and summary um, of the direction of travel and the upcoming uh, changes. Um, and uh, last but not least, of course, Adrian Valsetters is the current chair of Subcommittee 7. He's doing a fantastic job. We're working very closely with Adrian. He oversees now the, um, the development and the preparation of the draft of the, the next generation of Euro 7, all the three parts. Um, <clears throat> Right, now, now I don't want to spoil anything that uh, our speakers will present today, but uh, very briefly, just to set the context for the day. Uh, well, there is a number of challenges with the current version of Europe 7, but uh, for me, the biggest challenge was the lack of harmonization. And as you probably know, there is three design approaches. Um, there is material factoring approaches and load resistance factoring approaches and each member state of the European Union adopted one of the three design approaches. And now uh, you can see in the maps, for example, how fragmented is the map uh, of Europe in, in terms of the choice of design approach. Uh, now, some of those design approaches are better suited for, nu for numerical methods than others. Um, for example, I know that a number of countries that they have adopted design approach to only for the numerical methods they adopt the design approach uh, three. Um, there is other challenges, of course, the use of more advanced constitutive models for the material factoring approach, how you apply the partial factors, if it's from the beginning as an input or at discrete stages or as an excursion. So it is clear that while in the current version of Euro Code 7, the use of finite element methods is suggested for ULF checks, there is a clear lack of a more detailed guidance 
and there is a number of reasons, as we said, but there is a need to better understood that to better understood those issues, clarify before the ULS verifications can be can be routinely applied, carried out using finite element methods. And hopefully, uh, with the presentations today, uh, we will get a step closer in achieving that. Um, so without further ado, I will now introduce the speakers for the day. We have an excellent lineup. I have known them both for many years. Um, I will start with uh, Colin Smith. So Colin is the head of the Geotechnical Engineering Group at the University of Sheffield. He was, um, he is a member and he was a previous secretary of the Technical Committee 205 on safety and serviceability. He was a member of the Evolution Group 4 on the numerical methods. He has published several papers on Eurocode 7 and limit state design. So he's, he's, he's definitely an expert on the topic. And what Colin will be doing today is to give an overview, um, a brief description of the, the upcoming changes in the next generation of Eurocode 7. And um, so, and the second speaker of the day is Hoi Yeo. Um, he's a director at COVID and also a member of the, the ERTC 10. Hoi is a geotechnical engineer with 30 years, over 30 years of, uh, of experience in the, in the industry. He was previously, I think, Hoi for over 20 years in Arab Geotechnics. And he was the lead of the numerical skills team at Arab Geotechnics. And actually, we, we worked together um, for a, for a brief period of time in our, and he's currently at COVID. He's, he's responsible for the excellence team of numerical modeling in uh, uh, COVID. Um, he has also published several papers on the application of limit states and uh, the design approach one with Eurocode 7. Um, and he's very active in several working groups and forums in relation to, to Eurocode 7 and numerical analysis. Um, so that's all from me. Uh, thanks, everyone. And I will hand over now to Colin. So, so we'll get started. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that, Georges. Can can I just confirm that you can hear me and see the see the presentation? Yes, we can. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, so uh, you have to uh, turn your presentation on uh, presentation mode. Yeah, uh, make it full screen. Colin. Full screen, yes. You mean um, it's not in presentation mode, you're saying? Yes. Okay. Uh, on the, on the uh, right hand side, low. I think I'm just sharing the wrong screen then let's try that one is that better yes That's okay good. okay okay um uh, apologies for that little hiccup so um thank you georges it's a pleasure to speak to everyone on the latest developments in the new euro code as related to numerical methods and as georges has said i'm, I'm going to cover the main principles and ho will uh, talk about um specific examples so what I'm going to do is um, I'll just start with a caveat. This presentation is primarily based on the latest draft of the new Eurocode of November 2021 with some uh, additional updates. Um, so some of these issues may be subject to change. Um, the code is taking its final form, but it is obviously still subject to update. Um, so what I'm presenting uh, may, of course, change. Um, before talking about numerical methods, I think it's good just to get a few preliminaries in uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the, the coming new version of the Eurocode. So as you know, the uh, existing Eurocode um, uh, essentially came in three parts that are relevant to geotechnical engineers. So we had EN 1990, which is the basis of structural design. And then we had EN 1997 part one, which are the general rules and part two, which covered ground investigation and testing. Um, in the new version, uh, there are now four parts. Um, EN 1990 re remains, but it has been expanded or now explicitly covers geotechnical design. Um, we have a part one in EN 1997, which covers general rules, um, but that part one has been split into two um, and the 
sections dealing with geotechnical structures have been put into part three. Part two remains broadly the same in terms of looking at ground properties. So um, I'll be discussing primarily um, new changes in part one and part three. Also, um, we have a number of terminology changes. Um, I'm not going to cover them all. There isn't time to do that. But the key ones that are relevant to the presentation today are um, as follows. So what were described as design approaches in the current Euro code have now become designated as verification cases. And these essentially determine the factors on actions or effects of actions. And these are defined in EN 1990. These verification cases are used in conjunction with partial material factor sets, M1 and M2, which are defined in EN 1997 part one. Um, they're essentially unchanged from the current code. So M1 are essentially current unit factors and M2 are those associated with current design approach one combination two or design approach three partial factor sets. So effectively it's, it's 1.25 on TAN phi, 1.4 in CU, et cetera. Now um, <clears throat> we get to numerical methods. I thought it'd be useful just to take a quick survey of mentions of the code, just to see what's changed. So in the, in the old code, um, numerical methods were really only um, mentioned in passing. There wasn't really any specific guidance given on their use. I think I counted only five mentions in the entire code. In the Euro, Euro code, um, there are many more mentions, but in particular, there are dedicated sections, definitions, uh, tables devoted to numerical methods. And this, of course, as George has mentioned, acknowledges the fact that many, many engineers are using numerical methods. Numerical methods bring many advantages, and the aim in the new code uh, primarily is to enable straightforward usage and really not constrain the use of numerical methods or make it onerous task. Um, so what I'm going to do in this presentation is cover the key elements of the new sections uh, in the presentation, just to give you an overview of uh, what changes we made and how hopefully it's going to make life easier for those of us who use numerical methods um, with the Eurocode. So I'll kick off, kick off looking at um, part one and the changes there. What, what does part one say? So at the beginning, we now have a definition of numerical methods. Um, we've discussed this quite a lot in some of our task groups, and it's quite difficult to come up with a definition. Um, for me, the key characteristic is that numerical methods are general purpose and not generally specific to a particular problem type or a failure mode. And so they're going to work best with generally applicable par partial factor sets. The other key advantage is they have the power to home in on the critical failure mechanism automatically. And so it's not generally efficient to use numerical methods to evaluate a specific failure mode, as we often do with hand calculations. And thus it means that resistance factoring approaches are not generally applicable to numerical methods since the mode of failure and, and thus the available resistance must be known in advance. So that doesn't really use the full power of numerical methods. So we need approaches uh, that factor well-defined actions or action effects and or material properties. And these are what are specified for the numerical methods. So to sort of give you the initial overview, um, we have what are, what's recommended in the code is a dual check for all problem types. Um, we have a, a check that broadly covers geotechnical ULSs, which is a materials factoring approach, where primarily the, um, uh, we factor parameters before we do our uh, calculation model or numerical analysis. And then we have one that is broadly a structural ULS, where we undertake our analysis first and then factor the outputs of that analysis, the, the action effects essentially. Um, while I've labeled these as MFA and EFA, I understand that uh, technically they're going to be known as, as broadly MFA approaches, uh, materials factoring approaches. 
So those of you who uh, look at that will perhaps recognize um, similarities to uh, the current design approach one, where we have two combinations. Um, but the, the structural ULS, the action effect approach is perhaps more analogous to what, what some people have been using uh, terming design approach two star DA two star, but we'll, we'll come to that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, it's, it's useful to perhaps reflect back on why we have two approaches. I, I know that uh, often it's criticized. Why, why do we have to have do two calculations? Um, certainly for hand calculations, that's a bit onerous now that most things are being automated. It's not that um, challenging. Um, you can find uh, the reasons, one of the reasons for adopting the two verifications uh, were uh, elaborated by Brian Simpson. Um, and as paper in 2013. And the aim is really to try and achieve a more consistent reliability level across a wide range of uncertainties and actions and material properties. And what he showed is that uh, in principle, having two sets of partial factors actually works better than trying to have a combined set uh, that, that factor simultaneously um, material properties and, and actions. So just a little bit more detail, um, the geotechnical ULS material factoring approach, um, either going to use strength reduction or a direct approach uh, factoring material properties directly to establish whether the system is stable with those factored strengths. In the structural ULS, we're taking an action effect. So in a retaining wall, we might be looking at the bending moment that's established in the wall. And we are factoring that uh, and then comparing that with the available strength of the wall. So often that's going to be established from an SLS analysis and then factored. Um, but if plastic reserves of strength are available in the system, then it's possible to take advantage of this in the analysis. And one way of doing that is to actually transfer the action effect factor from the actions to the resistance side. Uh, so essentially uh, assign that to the um, structural resistance and then carry out your analysis and that facilitates an analysis that can capitalize on plastic reserves of strength. <clears throat> That's a kind of broad overview. In terms of text, this is what uh, we have a clause 8.2 which uh, outlines the procedure for numerical models and effectively that's just saying in words what I've just gone over um, in the previous couple of slides. Uh, looking at the MFA and EFA approaches and uh, guides you as to the, the various partial factor sets. So we'll have a look at those partial factor sets, see what has changed, see what is relevant to numerical methods. Um, one thing before I go into that, just point out this is uh, a recommendation um, as to the approach that should be used for numerical methods, but it's not mandatory. So um, looking at the partial factor sets, uh, those two approaches are basically governed by this table from Ian 1990. And um, we have a number of partial factor sets, but the ones on the right hand side highlighted in blue, DC3 and DC4. Now this table is slightly out of date that those, those should be designated as verification cases. So technically they should be VC3 and VC4. Um, these are the factors of that are to be used with um, geotechnical design mainly, um, though VC1 can be used in certain circumstances with geotechnical design, uh, but these are the two that are recommended for numerical methods. Um, so I'll just pick out a few of the, the points here. So um, numerical methods, it's, it's generally going to work best if your permanent actions aren't factored. Um, so you don't factor those before you do your analysis, and that's primarily what's listed there. It's good to see that we have specific mention of water. So there's been a lot of debate about how to deal with water and how to deal with that very well in geotechnical um, analysis and design. Um, I think it's uh, acknowledged that generally you don't want to be part factoring water pressures and then feeding them into effective stress analysis. That just doesn't generally work very well, if not at all satisfactory. So here it is clear that we, we factor water pressures um, with a factor of one. And generally we, we, we look at the most 
uh, unfavorable conditions in terms of water table location or um, flow regime, rather than adopting a factor, we, we look for the most um, unfavorable general conditions that can arise. So that all works very nicely for uh, numerical methods. Um, for variable actions, and these are actions that are generally um, known in advance, they don't have to come out of a calculation. Uh, they're things that are generally externally applied, so they're quite easy to factor in advance. And so for DC3, um, they get a factor of 1.3, and you'll recognize this, these are the same factors essentially that you have for design approach one, combination two, and design approach three currently. And for DC4, we have this ratio of uh, gamma Q to gamma G. So that's the ratio of uh, variable to um, permanent factor, which comes out to be 1.1 in general. Um, I'll, I'll return to that a little bit later um, for those of you not familiar with that approach. There is uh, a factor on water here for variable, that's 1.15. Um, the note on this table says that this is generally to be applied to um, water pressures, perhaps arising from wave action or currents. So these are kind of externally applied water pressures rather than those internal to the soil. Um, so that again, all works very nicely with numerical methods in general. And uh, final factoring here, again, I will, I'll talk about this a bit more detail later on, is that, um, these factors are generally applied before we uh, feed or, or we do our calculation model use our numerical method. At the end of the analysis, once all the analysis has been carried out, we have factors on effects of actions, um, which are these values 1.35 on unfavorable effects and one on favorable. Um, I'll address those a, a little bit later. What you'll also see in the table, I don't want to get into this in any great detail, is that some of these factors are modified according to a consequence class. So this is essentially looking at the um, severity of the consequence of failure. And so we do modify factors now uh, according to that. But that's not specific to numerical methods. That's just going to change the numbers that you feed into the analysis depending on the, the uh, consequence class associated with the design that you're assessing. If we then turn to the materials factors table, um, again, there are modification factors for consequence class. I don't want to go into those. Those just change those numbers. Um, you'll see that M1 are all unit factors. M2 uh, are, again, the factors. You'll be familiar with those kind of numbers uh, coming from design approach one, combination two, or design approach three. There are some additional factors. So um, again, not directly relevant to numerical methods, but there are factors that uh, address um, critical state and residual friction. Um, but what I would say is, um, as well as that, of course, it's important to factor interface shear strength. There are, of course, a number of important issues around implementa implementation of materials factors with advanced constitutive models. Here we are essentially factoring the ultimate um, strength of the material. But where we have advanced constitutive models, things can become more complicated. Generally, um, the Eurocode is not looking to address those more complex issues and uh, it's leaving that to the user to understand how this your software that you're using is implementing the model and the potential knock-on effects of applying factors to your materials or to those parameters which end up providing the strength within the numerical model. Um, so the only uh, one, one nod to that, however, is this, that um, this particular factor um, is directed at numerical models. So where you're doing an effective stress analysis that maybe feeds into an undrained um, assessment, then uh, these are the, the factors that are um, recommended. So that covers um, the kind of numbers that we're using. None of the key numbers have changed really um, from the current version, but uh, how they're applied uh, perhaps changes and there are uh, additional factors to, to be included now in the table and some clarification, particularly around water pressures. So um, if we now just take a step back and uh, just recap on ULS factoring approaches, um, 
the reason, of course, we're applying partial factors is we're trying to render the probability of an ultimate limit state to be in an acceptable low level. And so generally, we're trying to apply them at source, uh, apply the factors appropriately to the, the parameters that are causing the uncertainty. Um, in general, we need to be very clear that these can be applied to parameters before or after the calculation model. So when I talked about input factoring, output factoring, um, those sit either side of the calculation model. If we have input factors to apply, we apply those to our parameters, we feed them into the calculation model, that then gives us an output. We then may factor those quantities and then we do assessment. But generally, um, application of action or resistance factors inside the calculation model does nasty things like violating equilibrium um, and very hard to do within a numerical model. Uh, and that's why we have to be very clear that we're doing it at the input and the output stages. Um, the MFA approaches, generally it's input factoring only. We have factors on materials and the factor on uh, variable actions. And we'd feed that into our calculation model, go straight to the assessment. In EFA, we adopt both input and output, output factoring. So as, as I mentioned when looking at the table, the variable unfavorable actions are factored by 1.1 at the input stage. Everything else is unfactored in general. At the output stage, where we're getting something, for example, like a bending moment in a wall, those factors are, uh, those quantities are factored by 1.35. So the net effect is that for variable unfavorable actions, at the end of the, the uh, process, we've, we've applied 1.1 and 1.35, which gives us a, a quantity of 1.5. Um, that only works, of course, if the system is linear, and we do have to be aware of that. And it's important as we're using any of the code to be aware of the reasons why we're applying factors to re reduce the probability of a ULS. And if those factors are not doing the job that we um, intend them to do, we need to be thinking quite carefully uh, about um, where we apply the factors or are we applying at the right stage? We're we applying them the right part of the model. Um, permanent and favorable actions will just feed through and, and of course, um, favorable ones will feed through the whole process and get a factor of 1.35. And further um, elements that are appearing in the new code are table 8.1. So, um, of course, in many cases, there are construction stages to be considered when uh, undertaking con construction, and it's important to assess um, each of those stages uh, as they proceed for safety. Uh, the recommendation, and um, so the idea is that the, the code is trying to clarify what is often common practice or has evolved when using the uh, current code. So the recommendation is that um, these EFA and MFA approaches, so these are the effectively column one and column two are adopted um, for each stage of the construction. In column two, uh, the recommended approach is to um, do the analysis using your, um, what are called representative values here that those essentially uh, are what we've what we're currently called in the current code characteristic values so here um, we're using representative or characteristic values and um, to do the, the the stage construction with those values and then use strength reduction procedure and equivalent to assess the safety or the ULS capacity at each stage of the construction. Column three provides an alternative. So if you're not able, if you're unable to use that or your, your software numerical method doesn't allow those kind of processes, then you can apply the factors directly um, to the materials in advance of the analysis. I'm not going to go into this table in great detail. Uh, I, I think Ho is going to talk about an example where, where some of this is illustrated. So I, I'll leave that to him. Um, to look at, but uh, key point is we've got um, construction stages are uh, specifically addressed in the code now. So that um, is a, a brief overview of the um, 
part one. I'd just like to say a little bit about part three. Uh, so again, there are a very quite a number of references back to numerical methods. Um, I'm just going to pick out three uh, aspects. So we've got slopes, we've got um, spread foundations, and we have uh, retaining structures. Uh, the part three covers uh, also, in addition, piled foundations, reinforced earth, ground improvement, etc. But I, I'll just talk about the, the, the three key key areas in this presentation. So. Um, in terms of uh, slopes and cuttings, um, the code uh, allows you to use numerical methods according to clause seven in part one, which um, is the clause that describes uh, some of that usage. Um, and the partial factors to be used for slopes um, are, are consistent with numerical methods as, as you'd expect and, and most people are using um, Currently, we're using design approach one combination two or design approach three, and essentially those are the partial factors associated with verification th case three and uh, material uh, property set M2. Um, so there's no real change there, and um, it, using those particular partial factor sets, I think um, generally people find is, it works very well with um, numerical methods. In terms of spread foundations, um, things are a little bit different. Um, again, the uh, it's it's required to verify uh, a range of ultimate limit states, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but the table of factors that is given. Um, recommends that uh, you can use uh, combinations A and B in this table or the single combination C. So A and B broadly uh, correspond to numerical methods. Um, but what you'll see is that in column A, there's a slight deviation because it adopts VC1, verification case one factors rather than verification case four. Now, what is the difference there? Well, essentially verification case four is the action effect uh, factoring approach where the factors are like 1.35 are applied at the end of the calculation. VC1 applies those at the beginning. Um, now that of course uh, is often quite appropriate for spread foundations. If you have a foundation, you know, if you know what the structural load is coming down onto that foundation, that is predetermined, it's known in advance, it's not something that needs to be determined during the calculation, then it is more appropriate to factor those actions at the input stage. Um, so <coughs> you have the choice effectively, um, but the recommendation for um, spread foundations is to uh, apply those factors in advance. But again, I think all of that works very well with numerical methods. Uh, as long as we know those action values in advance, then um, it doesn't provide a challenge that again makes using numerical methods uh, straightforward. Retaining structures are perhaps where things get a little bit more complicated. Um, the code allows you to use a numerical method, which is fine. And it uh, requires you to check a number of limit states. So I've I've copied a number of the diagrams from the code. You'll recognize these kind of failure modes, um, sort of global stability, stability of the wall, failure of, for example, a prop or, or multiple pro or a failure of um, basal heave and so on. So all of those um, generally have to be uh, assessed. And we know that, of course, numerical methods can um, really pick out the, the critical mechanism and that there's no real need to then assess all the other processes if we're using generic partial factor sets. So just to pick this out in a little bit more detail, um, in terms of what the code states for uh, assessing um, retaining structures, uh, you can use the MFA approach or the RFA approach. So the MFA approach is essentially the same as table 8.1 for numerical methods. 
Um, so that, that works fine in terms of um, rotational resistance. But uh, it's, it's useful just to take a step back and, and, and think what, what is the, um, just picking up on what I said earlier about the benefit of numerical methods, uh, can we take advantage of that? Is, that? is that going to work within the code? So taking a step back, if we're using a numerical method to um, assess stability, and we might be using an incremental elastoplastic analysis and looking to make sure that deformations remain small, or we can use a direct analysis, uh, looking directly at stability, perhaps using limit analysis, and establish that uh, it's stable if, for example, additional disturbing forces are required to take the system to ULS. In a numerical method, um, if either of those are achieved, then it's implicit that our design action is less than our design resistance. However, um, sometimes, or in many cases, it's not exactly clear where the design action and the design resistance lie. So if we have a very complicated failure mode in involving foundations, retaining structures, uh, embankments, etc., where in fact do those lie in the system? And uh, what, what, what is clear is that it is not necessary to establish ED and RD explicitly. If you can show in your numerical analysis that your deformations remain small or you need additional disturbing forces to take the system to ULS, then it is implicit that ED is less than RD and it is not necessarily necessary to, to state those explicitly. And that again works well with those recommended partial factors that we have in the system, um, and particularly for the MFA approach. Uh, for EFA, you can uh, obviously, if you're looking at a bending moment and factoring that and comparing it with a bending resistance, uh, you generally will do that. But when you're looking at kind of global stability type problems, um, you don't have to explicitly determine the ED and RD values. In addition, it's not necessary to assess specific failure modes. So for example, if I jump back to the previous slide, you know, we've got four failure modes among quite a lot at the, at the bottom here. It's not necessary to look at each one as long as you are happy that the method will implicitly check all those failure modes using the same partial factor set. You don't have to check them uh, individually. And um, there's a note in the code that essentially says in MFA, all possible geotechnical uh, ultimate limit states are verified by de demonstrating that equilibrium can still be obtained with design values of input parameters without excessive deformation or a failure mechanism being act activated. Um, so that, that really, uh, you know, um, clarifies that issue in terms of um, specific failure modes. And of course, um, if you look at something like a retaining wall or a gravity wall, um, you might assess bearing failure, you might assess, uh, uh, assess overturning, you might assess sliding. What often happens is you get a kind of combination of all of them. You get a bit of bearing failure, a bit of, bit of overturning and a bit of sliding as shown in this mechanism here. And, um, you know, you want to be sure that you're, you're assessing the critical mechanism rather than assessing um, individual cases. So that is now um, clear and uh, is permitted in the code. <clears throat> That's um, a kind of brief overview of all the ULS um, guidance, the key, the key kind of elements in the code. Um, say a little bit about SLS. Uh, Generally, not, nothing much is changing here. Unit partial factors are applied. Um, SLS uh, usually works well with numerical methods. It's going to give you deformations that you can check. Uh, it's clearly good practice to involve uh, a sensitivity analysis when doing SLS ver verification. And if you're looking, for example, at ground movement assessment, uh, maybe with the observational method, then you might use most probable values of the soil rather than representative or characteristic values. Um, but essentially, most, are, I think, of the guidance is weighted towards the ultimate limit state. So um, to wrap up my section, um, 
uh, just come up with a few conclusions. So the new Eurocode acknowledges that the use of numerical models is becoming increasingly common among practitioners. So there are a number of specific clauses that address use of numerical methods. Um, the primary aim is to show engineers how to be code compliant with using numerical methods. Um, but it is assumed that uh, the engineers know how to use the numerical methods that they're employing. <clears throat> the ULS verification by numerical methods, a recommended approach is to design a check involving materials factors uh, approach, which is essentially input factoring and uh, an action effect factor approach, uh, which is essentially output factoring. And um, we feel that these allow the full power of numerical methods to be used in the, the assessment, that, that very general purpose um, approach that numerical methods provide. Guidance is given for stage, stage construction and uh, SLS is, is essentially unchanged. So I think that wraps up my part of the presentation. Um, uh, I think in combination with George's introduction, we're, we're on time. So um, I will uh, pass on now to uh, Ho for his part of the presentation. All right. Thank you, Colin. Right, I'll share my screen. Yes. Yeah. Right, just to confirm, can you see my screen now? Yes, just a moment if you like. I will, will ask everyone to give their questions in the Q&A and not in the chat, because in the Q&A we can see it all. Thank you. Back to you, are you? Right. Um, Thank, thank you, Colin, for, for a very clear and concise of descriptions of what is now uh, the proposals of um, um, next generations of EC7 and uh, for, for the guidance of uh, procedures in numerical modeling. My part of this uh, seminar is to provide you with a couple of um, um, design example of how this um, um, quotes uh, being applied in the design of uh, retaining structure. I mean, as you heard from, uh, from Colin, I mean, he presented very details of procedures of undertaking ULS design using numerical method <coughs> um, in the next generations of um, Euro code. I mean, for my presentation, I will briefly reiterate what he said and then describe how these procedures kind of um, compared to the current uh, EC7, um, the so quote. And I will then pro uh, uh, present two examples of retaining wall design um, to show you how this is done. And because I have used, um, obviously, I mean, th there hasn't been any sorts of um, um, guidance on the numerical modeling part using the current design code, the, the, the example that I, I'm going to present will be based on my experience using design approach one, which I think Colin has said that I mean, is, is, uh, is the sorts of uh, directions of travel uh, for the next generations of Euro code. I'm using advanced soil model in my presentation, so I thought it would be useful to give you a bit of um, 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 information or a bit of uh, um, guidance on the important aspects to be considered when you use uh, advanced soil model. And the design example that I'm going to present to you will be the Western Ticket Hall of Tottenham Court Road stations of Crossroad projects. It's in central London Steep Play site. The image is showing the excavation. And the second project is a, a soft clay site. I mean, unfortunately, I cannot give you um, the, the details of this project. And I'll finish off with uh, some observations and uh, a few uh, summaries or remarks uh, in terms of the conclusions that I made from, from this. I mean, you have seen this from um, Colin's presentation. We have basically, we have, it is recommended that 
ULSO verifications be, uh, be based on the less favorable of the model factor approach or effective uh, uh, effect of actions of uh, approach or effect factor approach. And, and obviously effect of action approach is, uh, is, is, uh, is basically called verification case four. And then the material factor um, ap approach is called verification um, um, case three. If you look at this, this table, um, Colin has explained that, I mean, this is EFA. You take the characteristic or representative values and run through your, your, your analysis, and then you apply the uh, partial factor on the effects of action. For material factor approach, I mean, there are two, two different ways that you can do it. One is the recommended one, the other one is the alternative one. The alternative one is simpler. You apply partial factor on your material and, and take your analysis to the end and you don't apply any factor to the, the output from, from that analysis. The recommended approach is slightly more complex, which I'll explain it using the, the, the example for retaining wall design, which will make it um, clearer. So in this table, uh, this design case is now replaced by verification case. And there are proposals to change a uh, couple of things in this table. For example, this partial factor apply on material. There's a, 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 a statement saying that you, you, you can use uh, uh, strength reduction procedures. We intend to delete this because not all the design tools um, allow this sort of um, uh, procedures to be implemented or the algorithm doesn't allow you to do this and you have to apply the partial factor yourselves um, before you, you, you run through the analysis. And also there are a couple of notes added just to try to explain this more complex, so I recommend that uh, method. Also there are a couple of um, 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 uh, changes that has been proposed for the terminology used here. The material factor approach um, is likely to be called input factoring now, and the e effects of um, effect factor approach will be called output factoring. And again, I mean, because of the, the potentials of confusion between input factoring and output factoring, there are notes added to clarify that the input factoring is, is a factoring of the material uh, parameters only, but not the, 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 the action. And the output factoring is only the, the, the factoring on the effects of actions only, not the resistance. Colin also uh, mentioned this, I mean, the, the, uh, the EN 1990, um, where you can find um, verification uh, case three and verification case four. And um, basically, I mean, uh, I'll just show this just to reiterate that, I mean, this, this is where you find uh, uh, this two verification case if you need the details. Just to make a comparison with the current Euro code seven, we have three different approaches. For those who are not familiar with the uh, Euro code, uh, current Euro code seven, these three approaches um, are adopted by different countries um, uh, in, in, in Europe and possibly across the world. And Jojo will show you the, the, the map of uh, where, where, in what countries um, engineers adopt which uh, design approach, which is kind of uh, quite fragmented. In the UK, we, we adopt design approach one and, and, and we have to do two combinations of um, calculation, which is pretty much what is uh, now recommended in numerical modeling of um, the next generation of Euro code. If you look at um, design approach two, those countries that adopt design approach two, they are fairly similar to combination one, but for retaining wall design, they need to check uh, for resistance factor of 1.4. Obviously, 
in numerical modeling, this is not possible. But if you are taking another additional sort of check, meaning that the likelihood that design approach two will be more critical than combination one of design approach one. If you look at design approach three, if you look at geotechnical actions, basically it is the, the same as um, combination two of uh, design approach one because uh, resistance factor one the resistance factor three is equal to one, which is the same as resistance factor one. If you then consider structural approach, you will need to apply partial factor on actions and material, which means that if you consider structural action, it will be more onerous than combination one of design approach one. Keep this in mind and, and then we can see what is the implication later on um, if you were to undertake the, the, the design using the next generations of uh, euro code. So, I mean, Colin mentioned about this. I mean, um, the next generation euro code is pretty much the design approach uh, one, combination one and two. Verification case four is equal to combination one, obviously with the consequence and factor of um, one. And uh, verification case three, is equal to um, combination two, except obviously the, the so-called uh, a bit of uh, 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 greater than one sort of partial factor being applied to variable load, which is, um, which is coming from wave or current sorts of uh, action. So because of that, I mean, um, what I did in the past using design approach one um, um, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, pretty much, I mean, um, uh, relevant to, 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 the, to what we do in, in the future in um, the je next generations of um, Eurocode. I mentioned that I'll try to explain uh, the, the more complex sort of um, um, uh, design or the analysis of procedures when we undertake the ultimate limit state design. You, you saw that table 8.1, there are three columns. The first column is, uh, is basically the first approach. You, you, you undertake your analysis using uh, characteristic value, go through the, the, the excavation sequence, and you apply the partial factor on the effects of action. And the second approach is to use factor parameters and then go through your analysis and you don't apply any partial factor on, on your, your forces. The third approach is, is you start from a combination one and then you take so-called modeling excursions at critical stages that you consider you want to look at the, 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 the forces under material factor approach more carefully. Virtually you, you switch your, your analysis applying affected soil properties um, uh, by taking this uh, modeling excursion. So that is, that is easier to, to, um, to explain than, 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 than the, the complex table 8.1. So basically this first approach is a so-called EFA, the first column. And the second column is the recommended approach under material factor um, uh, approach. And that is taking the modeling excursion and the alternative approach is um, this, this approach where you, you, you start with factor parameters and go through to the end. For those who are doing numerical modeling in geotechnical engineering, you know the importance of uh, uh, soil parameters uh, or soil, soil, soil models in, 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 your, in, in your analysis and uh, the importance of initial stress and how the ground behaves um, in terms of the, the stress path that it goes through and, and, and the importance of uh, choosing the right uh, soil model for your, for, your, uh, for your problems and especially when you're trying to use advanced soil model. And to make things complicated, applying um, um, all this um, um, soil model and undertaking ultimate limit state soil design, you need to know how and when to apply partial factors. And more importantly, you need to know what is the implications of applying 
um, such partial factor on your soil properties. I mean, in my, um, in my uh, ex work example, I'm using brick soil model by Brian Simpson, small strain hardening soil model um, for excavation in, in stiff clay. And I will also use soft soil model for excavation in soft clay. I mean, these are um, images of uh, some of the major characteristics of, uh, of these soil models. I won't have the time to go through them, but what I have done in my presentation is to stick to uh, uh, as much as possible, stick to this color coding. When I present the result for brick model, I use a blue um, blue line, um, red line for small strain hardening soil model, and green line for soft soil model. Factoring soil strength, I mean, as I previously mentioned, you can directly apply it on the, on the soil properties or you can use uh, strength reduction procedures. When you use simple soil model like elastic perfectly, uh, perfectly plastic, um, uh, more column model, it is easier to apply partial factor. I mean, if you do your analysis in undrained uh, total stress condition, you input it as CU or undrained shear strength, you apply the partial factor on it directly if it is drained shear strength parameters, you apply the corresponding partial factor on it. The problem is when you have mixed undrained and drained soil and you have so-called strength reduction soil procedures and, and you need to hit a correct or so, so a right level of um, partial factor. And, and because CU and phi dash and C dash have different soil partial factor. So where, where you need to stop if you use strength reduction procedures, is, uh, is, uh, is critical. When you start to use more complex soil model like Hardring's uh, soil model, uh, it makes, because the strength parameters is, uh, is, uh, is uh, effective strength parameters as your input, applying partial factors um, uh, based on effective strength parameters doesn't always bring you the equivalent undrained partial factor if you are running it uh, for 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 um, for undrained soil condition, I mean this is an example of uh, of um, of um, uh, factoring that I did for brick model with brick characteristics so, so parameters. I I apply a factor of one point four. When I start to factor down the soil strength, and and they are fairly close, but not always um, the case depending on the soil model that you are, you are dealing with. As I said, I mean, you need to be careful what you, what you do and uh, brick model, the area under the A-shaped curves uh, defines the effective strength parameters. I mean, if you look at Brian Simpson's uh, ranking lecture, that is what, what, uh, what he said. And by factoring the strength parameters, you could potentially uh, influence um, the, the non-linear sort of uh, um, stiffness degradation sort of curves. Hardening soil model is, uh, is another example. If you undertake undrained calculation, it underpredicts the undrained shear strength uh, of over-consolidated clay at low effective stress level. And, and uh, because the formulation um, the stiffness is um, is uh, is, a, is dependence on the, um, the strength and also the, the stress. And um, for one software, you see that I mean the, the dependency of the, the, the stress is uh, based on minor principal stress. And there, there's another software that um, that uh, use uh, mean effective stress in 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 the in the in the formulations of the stiffness. And, and those are the important, important uh, area that you need to focus. When you start to factor down the strength, you potentially factor down the stiffness and all that has got to be taken into considerations when you, when you uh, try to um, undertake your ULS or so assessment of your uh, geotechnical uh, problem. Let's just go to the first example. Western Ticket Hall is a stiff clay site and it's um, uh, just south of Tottenham Court Road. Uh, um, 
um, uh, sorry, south of Oxford Street is a Tottenham Court Road station, part of Tottenham Court Road station. And the size of the excavation is 50 meters uh, north to south, and um, the width is between 25 to 30 meters. It's designed as a multi prop retaining structure with the maximum excavations of um, around 30 meters. Bottom up constructions with uh, five meters, uh, five levels of temporary prop. This is an image of the finished uh, structure. Ground and ground water conditions, typically in, in central London, in that area, you have a few meters of mid ground over terrace gravel. And beneath that London clay and, um, and, and followed by Lambert Bait, uh, Tyler Sand and Chalk. I mean, this is a, the properties which I'm not going to go into details and typical so under drains of uh, groundwater profile in central London. The first step uh, in, um, in um, um, using soil model is to try to get a good, um, a good understanding of the, 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 the the performance of the, the model with the test data. This is triaxial compression uh, isotropic, um, consolidation isotropic triaxial and drain tests under compression and extension. And for brick model and hardening soil model. And then um, you then need to have a, um, have a um, um, clear indications of whether they match the stiffness profile. Obviously, these soil models are isotropic model and, uh, and you match the uh, compression side but not the extension side. And those are the compromise that you have to take. I mean, if you are doing numerical modeling. The way I compare this, uh, this, um, this results is that I mean, uh, I used uh, the original design which is undertaken using OASIS full software. And this OASIS through software is a pseudo final elements or wall design software. It's not final elements, but it's, a, it's conventional so design, retaining wall design software. What I did was that I extracted the, the envelopes of the, the bending moments of, from the through program and normalized it uh, to the maximum um, bending moments of, um, of um, the, the envelopes which is now plotted in, in black. When I undertake analysis using uh, other soil model, brick and hardening soil model, I did the same. I normalized it by factoring uh, it with, uh, with um, um, the maximum values um, of, uh, of the bending moment uh, from through. And what you get is that anything that is lesser than, 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 than the through envelope, is, um, is, is showing that, I mean, the, 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 the analysis is, um, is, um, is um, I mean, uh, slightly uh, more, more economical in terms of design uh, compared to fruits of uh, output. And then when I compare it against, against a, another uh, design approach, for example, this, um, this is verification for when I apply partial factor on the effects of actions, when I apply the partial factor on material, then I, I, I did the same. And you can see that, I mean, the distance between the black and the, 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 the color line show you how, how uh, the, the, the relative magnitude of the bending moment, which means that, I mean, for this alternative um, material factor approach, I mean, this is less critical than the effective factor approach. So, so calculation. And that is how I have compared them. And I compare all the, all the results based on, based on that approach for this particular soft, uh, stiff clay site and also the soft clay site. So I repeat this um, uh, alternative um, uh, material factor approach and, 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 um, and, and, and repeat that you use uh, with the recommended material factor approach. Which is uh, which is the, the recommended um, um, source of sequence under verification case three, and you can see that they are still within the black line, meaning that this is less critical than the first uh, first case, which is a effective uh, factor approach. So from this, I mean, sorry. 
the last bit is, is this, I mean, uh, the, there's another part of it, which when, when I mentioned about factoring strength and then you, you can factor down the stiffness as well. And when you look at the effects of factoring down the stiffness, brick is giving us a, a more uh, critical soil design than hardening soil models. And, and, and you need to be careful when you factor down the, 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 the strength you might be factoring down the stiffness and all that has got to be carefully considered. I mean, there's a possibility that, I mean, when you factor down one of the soil model, you change the characteristic of the, the, the stiffness profile and it can lead to some unforeseen sorts of um, uh, output. In conclusion for the stiff clay site, I mean, um, verification case four or the effect Act, uh, effects of um, uh, effect factoring approach is, uh, is, is governing the design and factoring material from outset or taking the design excursion is not critical in, in this particular uh, um, um, uh, uh, design case. And under, under this um, uh, we, um, a verification case three, when you factor both the material strength and stiffness, and it becomes more critical for one, one soil model, but not the other one. So those are the sorts of, sorts of um, uh, considerations you, you need to, 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 to take when you um, uh, start fact, applying factor on ultimate limit states or design. The second case is the soft clay site. It has got 17 meters of soft clay and the excavations is um, about 20, 27, 28 meters deep. And beneath the soft clay, we have a more competent soil. And the design has been done using a more column model. And um, for combination one or verification um, case four, I mean, that is a more critical case. And, and for combination two or verification uh, three, and it's less critical, but you can see that, I mean, the, 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 the positive, when, when we undertake the verification using verification case four, the critical part of the, the forces is on the positive side of the bending moment. As we apply partial factor on, on, on material with the, the the behavior starts to switch and, and the negative moment is, uh, is growing and growing. And that is for more column model. The way I uh, have uh, um, verified using soft soil model is to, first of all, um, derive a set of parameters, the strength parameters that match as close as possible to the more column model undrained shear strength, which is uh, five plus one and a half Z, which is very soft soil material. And the 1.4 factor is applied on the undrained uh, shear strength on, on, uh, on, the, um, on the more column model. But when you apply um, the partial factor on the effective strength parameters of five uh, KPA and uh, 22 degrees, again, you are not getting an equivalent of 1.4. The partial factor, the equivalent partial factor is between 1.3 to 1.4. I plotted um, the, the same source of output, comparing the, the more column and um, the, the soft soil output, and you can see that effective um, uh, uh, effect of uh, uh, effect factor approach or verification case four is governing the design and um, the the material factor approach uh, are less critical whether you undertake it using alternative or recommended method. So in conclusion for the soft clay site, again, I mean, uh, verification case four governed the design and the verification case three by factoring material from outset or taking excursion is not critical. It's important for me to stress that, I mean, Verification case three is not important here is because 
possibly is because the, 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 the geometry and its construction sequence and the ground conditions that I have, um, I have used to present this uh, design case. I mean, your design may be governed by, by the verification case three. So you must check both verification if unsure. I mean, obviously the recommendation of the, the code is that you, you virtually um, uh, use the most unfavorable out of the two design approaches or out of the two uh, verification ca uh, cases. And, and that is a critical sort of point that you must take away. If you are not sure, check both of them. Coming back to the, the, the um, uh, comparison between uh, the existing and the new code, for those who are using design approach two, you can see that they are equal to design uh, verification case four or combination one but you have not checked uh, the combination two. So moving into the future, you will have to uh, check uh, combination two or ver verification case three. Obviously, until the next generations of Euro um, uh, is a uh, rollout in the next few years, you don't have to be worried about it. You can, you can still adopt what you are doing, but this, these are the sorts of uh, changes that you, you have to make. For those uh, using design approach two, you have to do a, an additional verification case three. For those who are using design approach three, uh, for geotechnical actions, uh, there's, uh, you, you only check it for verification three, and then now you have to check it against verification uh, case four, because your structural action, which is um, applying partial factor on action and material factor is, uh, is maybe uh, more onerous or it is more onerous than the verification for case four. So you have to um, virtually re um, uh, do a verification case four um, as, um, as uh, to replace your uh, structural action sorts of um, verification. Conclusions, next generations of um, um, uh, Eurocode 7 for numerical modeling, the procedures is equivalent to the current design approach 1. Colin has said that, I, I reiterated that. For the, con the construction sequence and ground conditions that are presented, I mean, uh, verification case 4 is more critical. Uh, for both soft clay and the uh, stiff clay site. I mean, I must emphasize that that is based on what I assume uh, as the construction sequence and the ground conditions. And verification three is, uh, is not critical either uh, whether you apply the, the, the partial factor from the outset or taking modeling excursion. Under the current um, design code, I guess, I mean, I've mentioned it, design approach two, has not uh, taken into consideration verification case three, but if you apply a resistance factor of, um, of um, uh, greater than one, it might cover your, your verification for, uh, for, 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 the, um, uh, for this combination too. For desired approach three, it is not um, conservative if you consider the geotechnical actions, but it's too cons conservative for structural design uh, with partial factor uh, on actions and material. So from that, you can see that, I mean, um, between now and then, um, there are changes to the, to the next generation of Euro code that you will need to start um, uh, making the change when it becomes um, 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 the replacement code in the future. That's all that I have to say. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Ray. I will give the word to Georgios for the questions in the Q&A. Yes. Thank you, Kat. There is, um, yeah, there are a few questions on the Q&A. Okay. Um, right, so there is Andre. Um, for diaphragm walls, the effect factoring approach yields usually larger bedding moments than the material factoring approach. 
don't know if that's a question or an observation. Um, and in SLS, we usually neglect the nonlinearity in the structure due to cracks, etc., and creep. Therefore, we we underestimate the structural deformations. Um, that's from Adre, his observations. And there is also from Amir um, asking about the observational approach. If we need to apply any factors in the analysis, if there is any uh, uh, guidance in the Europe at 7. I don't know, Colin, you want to respond to that about the observational method? Um, I'm not that familiar with the observational method. I know it's, it's, um, it's addressed more extensively in the current, in the new version. Um, I don't know how whether you're <laughs> you're more experienced in that one. You well, can answer that one better. I can I can try to answer that. I mean, for observational method, I mean, you still you still need to uh, fulfill all the requirements of uh, the code requirements, despite the fact that you use um, 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 most probable sort of parameters. I mean, uh, eventually you still need to 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 make sure that your structure uh, can fulfill the ultimate limit state. And uh, and uh, and with uh, with uh, with uh, with your construction sequence and the contingency plan that you you put in place, there's no um, no shortcut to that, unfortunately. There is a comment also about the design approach one combination two that you might not reproduce the in situ state with the factor friction, the factor material properties. Um, yes, I mean, uh, you are right that I mean, um, that's why I mean, this um, combination two taking design excursions or the recommended, the recommended sort of um, uh, approach is more, more, um, is, is preferred because you are, you are following the, the, the stress state in the ground as close as possible to the characteristic value and you only take the excursions for critical stages. And, and at least that doesn't uh, start off uh, your model from a wrong in situ stress state. So, so those are the sorts of things that, uh, that, that, uh, that is, has been taken into consideration and the reason why, why the excursion sorts of uh, method is uh, recommended instead of uh, the, the alternative where you, you factor soil properties and, and, and carried out the assessment from, from, the, from, from the outset. Yeah, because at least you start from the correct K, not from the initial stress field. Yes, yes. I mean, so the recommended ones uh, give, you, give, you, give you the correct soil stress state from the beginning. Classical carding soil can, in case of consolidation, and due to a superior uh, model memory reset caused by unloading or round off error. Um, that is um, that is something that obviously I mean, if you if you want to have a have a if you want to give us more detail, then perhaps I mean that we I can take that. Uh, outside this discussion. Well, that's more for SLS, no? I don't think it's related to ULS. Is it? uh, it's, I think, I think that, that this is, this is, uh, this could potentially be, 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 uh, you mean model, mem model memory being the stress history or? Sh yeah, maybe Adre can clarify on the Q&A. Yeah, yeah. With a new comment on that. I mean, soil what models, I mean, the important, the important of understanding how your soil model behaves is uh, is important is is critical in in what you do in numerical modeling, and if you see, and for example what I mentioned there is under predictions of uh, unrange shear strength and things like that, and and it is critical that that all this, um, um, uh, all this detail of uh, how the algorithm works. You know, you need you need to have a good understanding of it, and obviously, the more you use the soil model, the more you you have experience. There is a, there is also a question about the phi C reduction. How exactly does the phi C reduction, or a method tool implemented in most software packages, fit into those approaches? 
I mean, C5 reduction is um, is um, is pretty much a black box depending on what type of soil that you are soil model that you are using. Certain soil model switch over to more column and, and not bothered with um, the, the the behavior or the complex behavior of the advanced soil model and and just do the C5 reduction uh, gradually within within the software. So again, I mean, this sort of um, this sort of um, 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 approach, you must have a good understanding of how the soil model that you use and how the algorithm affect the, the, the behavior of your soil model, whether it is just directly applying a factor um, on, on the C5 and not bothered with the, 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 the other characteristic like change in stiffness and all that sort of things. I mean, you need to understand that. I mean, I cannot give you any sort of direct sort of um, guidance unless you 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 have specific sorts of details that you want to you want to share with me then I can try to have a look up what what uh, what possibly be the the, the 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 algorithm that they have used but most of those tools they drive the system to failure right the price reduction yes I mean they keep doing it but the problem is that I mean what what does the soil model do? I mean, that, 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 that is critical. It's not only, they will mm. drive it to failure, but, um, but you need to understand when in the process of driving it to feel failure, what is the, what is the, the, what is the, the actual uh, calculations that it's doing uh, in the background. Yeah. There is a question from Suzanne. Do you have any insight into how the new Eurocode 7 approaches numerical modeling, but for rock engineering. Uh, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We we normally we normally try to simplify the rock into. It depends on the type of rock. I mean, if the rock is uh, is uh, heavily jointed, I mean, we 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 can use uh, uh, approximations of the rock model, but. Uh, I'm not the not the massive sort of rock type of modeling. I'm not very familiar with that. Yeah, I'm I'm not that familiar. I know I know there's a lot more gone into the code about rock engineering um, because the current code doesn't have very much on that. Uh, and in the appendix, there is a range of recommended analysis methods for rock mechanics problems, which tend to be the sort of limit equilibrium ones, uh, slip circle type approaches. But again, it very much depends on whether you've got very jointed rock or um you know monolithic blocks um my suspicion is that getting the the numeric getting the rock engineering into the code uh has been quite a task and uh getting numerical methods into the code in a coherent way uh, has also been a task so that that is something that um perhaps has not quite got there <laughs> at this stage um I think, uh, yeah, any of the methods, if, if the numeric, if you feel the numerical method that you're using is appropriate for rock, then um, um, you would apply the techniques that are, are in the code. But, you know, again, it depends on the material models you're using. But if it's, if it's simple friction models in blocks, we, we did have a debate a couple of days ago about the Hoyt-Brown model and how you would factor that. And again, I think it's, it's having an insight as to yeah. what parameters control that. And how you interpret, you know, what how you're trying to get safety into the system. So you might take an, a, an approach that that the Hoyt Brown model is providing a nonlinear um, yield envelope and simply scale that in the same way that you, you'd scale C and phi models, um, because you can you can bracket uh, a nonlinear failure envelope by a whole load of linear C phi envelopes. But um, to answer the, the question, I don't think there is um, specific guidance. Uh, given in the code that I'm aware of. Yep. All right, there is another question. Would the method where one increase the loads according to uh, VC3, but not the bulk density, and then runs a 5C reduction be an allowed variant of the, the material factoring approach? So I'm not quite clear. I mean, mm. in VC3, we're not really factoring anything mm. apart from the variable and favorable actions. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not quite clear. 
Um, so it's it's uh, it's material fact. So maybe in principle the question is if we can run phi C reduction instead instead of applying the factor, which I think we discussed previously about the phi C oh, yeah, I mean, if, tools, yeah. if you have a model to run under under uh, combination three um, so called verification case three and you want to run the C phi reduction you can. The only problem is uh, uh, is the one that I highlighted there. If you have, if you're laid soil with uh, drain and undrained soil input Cu and phi dash C dash, then then where do you stop the C phi reduction? Because C phi reduction, I mean, some software allows you to set set a partial factor that 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 stop the 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 the, the computation, but if you got CU input, and then you, you need 1.4, and then five C dash phi dash, you need 1.25 on tangents of, of the phi dash, then you, you don't know where to stop. So that 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 is that is what uh, what uh, is critical there when you do the automated sorts of um, C phi reduction or strength reduction um, uh, approach. Right, and there is another question from Eric. I noticed that under uh, VC3, consequence factor is not applied on the loading, but only on the material strength. Is there any reason behind? Also, how is the consequence factor determined? Is it necessarily only 1.1, 1, .1, 1 or 0.9? I'm not gonna have a go at the first one. I think I'm, I'm, I'm not directly uh, clear. The reason, but I think within uh, VC3 and VC4, this idea that we're applying factors either primarily to material properties or to actions so that we can ensure that we achieve the correct reliability over a whole range of uncertainties of both action and material properties. So the, the underlying principle is that essentially either you're factoring material properties or you're factoring actions. So this consequence factor is obviously more logically applied to those parameters that already have factors on them. Those that have unit factors, essentially we're saying don't factor them. So uh, applying the consequence factor to that doesn't really make sense. So that you've got uh, in VC3, you've got the consequence factors on the material factors. In VC4, it's on the, the action factors. Um, with regard to 1.11 and 0.9, um, those are what are in the code. I think they can be varied in the national the NDP, but I, I, I don't know if there are any variants allowed on that. Don't think my colleagues know either. <laughs> I don't think there is an option to, to vary that in the national Linux, uh, but we can double check it. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it's fixed. Right. Um, could you please elaborate which set of partial factors should be applied in the design of slope stability, finite element analysis, flux? So I think for slope analysis, it's, it's VC3 and M2. So it's the, mm. that's, that's the recommended uh, oh. approach for slope analysis. So you're not factoring oh. any actions, any weights, only variable and variable actions, which are generally external and you're um, reducing the strength. There is a series of questions from Ed. Uh, groundwater level in the design is one of governing factors in the design of retaining wall and slopes with soil nails. So the method to determine the design groundwater level is critical. How to determine the characteristic value of design groundwater was recommended in Europa 7. How to interpret worst credible groundwater conditions. Are there any differences <coughs> in the design groundwater in ULS and SLS cases? If some groundwater monitoring data is available, what assessments are recommended to interpret the data and obtain design groundwater? It is not uncommon to encounter a situation of no groundwater monitoring or no groundwater capture and monitoring. How should design groundwater be determined as soon? Uh, so I, th I think this relates to my comment about groundwater. 
I didn't have time to go into, into it in detail. So I, I, I made some very general comments about um, worse credible groundwater conditions. There is in fact quite a lot of uh, guidance in the code um, very specifically directed at this that covers yeah. these areas in a lot of detail. Actually, um, actually, Colin, we are we are planning to organize a separate event, yeah. uh, an online lecture only on groundwater because that's yes. that's a huge topic. Yes. Um, yes. So uh, I think I think rather yeah. trying to answer that here, we'll, <laughs> we'll leave it to that that meeting because there's there's a whole range of issues and really it, it, it helps to have diagrams yeah. and slides so, to, to illustrate those. Exactly that. So we will have a dedicated. Uh, um, uh, online lecture only on groundwater with experts from the subcommittee seven on the topic. Okay. Um, is the idea of output factoring similar to the global factor approach? I don't think it is. No. I don't think so. No, we spoke about the terminology when we say, and that's exactly the pushback from us because the terminology output factoring will cause this sort of confusion to people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it might look like that in some cases, but uh, it's it's not the it's not the not, yeah, it isn't. Uh, refer to table eight point one. What is the recommended approach for slope design, column two or column three? Will there be any difference if the slope is reinforced with nails or anchors? I think we answered that about the slope stability. No. Yes, I think I think it's only um, if you're using a sophisticated model and the strength, if you're using strength reduction, for example, it, it leads to different conditions. But at the end of the day, so unless the pathway to failure is, is important, um, sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't, and I'm not sure there's going to be a lot of difference there. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure if, if you've got reinforcement in there. Again, again, it depends on the, the model you're using. Um, there is a question from Elnaz, I think, directed mostly to Hoy. Considering the fact that you have concluded VC3 has not been critical, I think it's, it is not necessarily the case with the current uh, uh, design approach one combination two, because we see, for instance, that design approach combination two can be critical check for the global stability of a cover dam in finite element modeling. How do you see that? I think that's exactly well, what you said, uh, well, Jorge, no? But, well, what, what I see is, uh, is, um, is, uh, is clear, I mean, it doesn't mean that I mean the um, uh, combination two doesn't uh, is is not critical. Combination two can be critical depending on the, on the soil type and how you build um, the the the, the, the uh, retaining structure. And uh, that's why I put put on the red uh, warning there. I mean based on the. Um, conditions uh, that I presented and in terms of ground conditions and construction sequencing combination one uh, is, uh, is uh, has been critical for both the cases but it doesn't mean that is the case I mean you need to be sure that I mean uh, um, um, one of the or you need to make sure that you, you select the most critical one and, and carry on with it if you're not sure you need to carry out both uh, combination uh, in order to, to make sure that you, you, you cover both the combination in your analysis. It doesn't mean that um, combination one is, is critical. It depends on the mobilized strength, no, right? Yeah. Uh, it's like kind of... Soil, uh, soil geometry, sequence, how much, how much soil strength you mobilize. Yeah, I'm, I mean... For, the more for you the mobilize, soil, the closer you get to make it for, more critical. For the soft clay, I, I was expecting it to... to for combination two to, to govern, but because of the ground conditions that I've got in that model, we have yeah. a competent soil beneath that 17 meters of soft clay. And that possibly um, dictate how the retaining wall behaves because it is a multi-prop retaining wall and, and you go down gradually and, and, and if you've got more competent ground beneath them, and if you start to model it with uh, maybe 25 meters of um, soft clay, you might see a different picture. 
and and it's a function of how much you mobilize, and it's a function of how much the the the, the ground uh, pushing on the wall. And at the moment, for that particular case, it is not critical. Yeah, and I, th I think I mean in general, often uh, VC three or DA one two is more critical for global failure. But as you said, Ho, it very much depends on your your ground yeah. profile and the construction method. Um, so that's why we check both, basically. Um, yes. I think generally DA12 or VC3 is going to guard you against global stability and um, VC4 is more likely to govern the structural side, but not always. <laughs> so yes, we have to do both. Right, let's move on. In, uh, in applying the partial material factor 1.4 on a drain shear strength, any recommendation on the value of shear strength where this 1.4 shall be applied to? Usually, usually it's applied to to characteristic value of the undrained shear strength, and, and and you need to decide what is the characteristic values of uh, the soil that you are dealing with. And honestly, if you look at the current euro code, is um, the, the the characteristic value is um, is the the the, the cost of estimates of the soil properties that affect your 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 um, uh, uh, limit state. If, if your limit state is, um, is, uh, is, if you have experience in the past that your limit state is governed by, by certain sets of parameters, then, then that sets of parameters is, uh, is what you need to factor it down from. I mean, for most of the cases, we call it characteristic and, 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 um, and it's 95% confidence level. But some of the design, I mean, for example, if you look at the, um, some of the power design in, in, in the UK, I mean, the, all the established sorts of design profile is based on mean value. And then you can then take mean value as your, as your, as your um, 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 profile. And then if you want to factor from that point, you factor from that point. So it's a function of how you, how you design your, your structure and, and how, how confident you are in terms of your soil properties. In not exceeding the limit state that you are you are dealing with. <clears throat> right, there is a question about the two uh, material oh, factors. Okay. I think I think maybe I've not made it clear. I mean, uh, hardening soil, small strain hardening soil model is uh, is is one type of advanced soil model and brick model is a is a is a diff, different different soil soil model altogether so i don't uh, i mean there's no i guess i mean the latest version is, is where where you find the the, the 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 latest version in the software i don't think that they have changed much from from the two two model that i am familiar with Then there is a comment. I noted numerical model used should not be specific to a particular failure mode. How limit equilibrium method in overall stability check using slope W fits in Eurocode 7? Okay, so that's an interesting one. Um, so limit equilibrium methods in, in classical slope stability analysis are specific to particular type of failure modes, but do search for a, a large range. And, and sometimes these methods uh, are able to pick out non-circular mechanisms. I think it doesn't really matter because slope stability, the, the recommended approach is uh, VC3, which is recommended for numeric models. Um, so uh, they're essentially the same. And limit equilibrium is a method that is um, permitted in the Eurocode for uh, slope stability. So yes, we can still use slope W. Yes. <laughs> um, why would why would recommend to apply material factors only in specific states, since partial factors are due to cover uncertainties in a specific aspect, like soil parameters, and in theory there should be possible values. Why is the uncertainty addressed only? discrete construction stages and not right from the beginning. It seems more like an old general safety factor than a partial factor applied to the material properties. Uh, 
So this is more the recommended so, so MFA approach, and obviously yes. we we, ex, uh, we 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 discuss it before, and um, yes, um, we need the 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 the, the ground to have the correct sort of uh, stress state and then 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 you, you then you then as you excavate you have got quite a few sequences I and mean, if you start off with uh, the, the fact that soil uh, properties the stress state in the ground might not be correct and then you you can get any results that you you you, you don't want so if you maintain the stress state in the ground to be as close as possible to the stress state in the ground and start to look at critical points where the excavations or the construction tends to give you the, the, the worst condition. Then you then look at the, the, the material factor uh, uh, effects of, 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 of that particular stage and that is more sensible. And, and uh, all this sort of discussion has gone on for a long while, and and uh, that the reason for selecting this as the recommended um, 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 uh, approach or method is because of the fact that um, you maintain the correct stress state in the ground as you as you progress your excavation and only apply partial factor to to stages where you 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 want to look at um, the the consequences of the the the, um, the uncertainties in the ground. So that, that is the, the background to it. How, how would you approach critical stage soil models with input material factory? Because there is no clear strength parameter value available up front. That's similar to the brick, no? Yeah, it's similar to the brick model. I mean, you need to find, find a way of doing it. And brick model doesn't give you five dash. Brick model only gives you the, the uh, the degradation curve and and all the rest of the parameters, you have to you have to find a way uh, to 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 do it and and um, and I'm sure that I mean the whatever model that you use, there will be a way of determining the the um, uh, strength parameters, and 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 you have to use that to um, to see how you can factor it and. That's why I mean, understanding the model that you are using is extremely important. Yes, and the Eurocode Seven cannot possibly give guidance because there is a large number exactly. of <laughs> constitutive models, and there are new ones popping up every year. So, I think what's important, the principle is that the user need to 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 derive a set of input parameters that results in a factor of strength yeah. in accordance with what the Eurocode Seven suggests. That's the only way. But that's, yeah, it requires a bit of extra effort to do this calibration exercise up front. Yeah, um, yeah I think, I think, I mean, as I mentioned it before, I mean, uh, <laughs> different software possibly program, program similar type of soil model in a different way. And I mentioned yes. about this hardening soil model where the, 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 the stiffness is a function of minimum um, or minor principal stress, and the other software use um, use a, a min min effective stress. So, so those are the sorts of things that the, all the users needs to be aware of. Yeah. When you factor five dust peak by one point two five and five CV critical state by one point one, then you might have strange situations. Well, that's true, but you need to use engineering judgment, I think, and. The factor peak cannot be less than the factor CV. No. Um, um, so yes, I think, uh, yeah. I think it. Yeah, it depends on the model that you're using. I, I'm guessing this is this. This isn't necessary. You know, these factors are not necessarily directed at numerical methods. But if you're using a, a numerical model that will model peak and critical state at the same time, then. <laughs> You've got to think quite carefully about how how those factors are implemented and and how yes. how those strengths are derived. Um, but I, I I think it, that that's obviously a change or an addition to the current code. That um, it's a nod to the fact I think that critical state parameters are often regarded as more reliable than peak. Um, but yeah, it's. Again, down to the model you're using. If you're using a very simple model, I think it's quite straightforward. If you're not, then it, it is, it's something you've got to be aware of.
In VC4, initial stresses should always be based on reduced strength parameters. Otherwise, failure points could occur. Mm -hmm. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's the opposite, isn't it? I mean, sir. If you use you use the normal or characteristic strength, you have less chance of um, uh, failure point. I mean, if yeah, you have yeah. failure points, I mean, your model is not right because, uh, because uh, the, the 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 in situ soil uh, stress state should be should be should not should not have failure point in the ground or theoretically yeah. should not. Um, is MFA approach limited only to models which define the strength by using the parameters for seen by Eurocode 7, C dust and phi dust? For example, in our sound or similar models which use different approaches to define strength can be used only by EFA approach. Thanks. I think we discussed this about the more advanced constitutive models. No, it's the yeah. same pretty much approach. Yeah. yeah, everybody needs to, or whoever that used the, the the soil model needs to needs to understand how how they can apply it uh, with MFA. Yeah. There should be also a comment on dilatancy for five uh, certain value depends on mass size. We will not get a, a unique solution. I think that's probably beyond the, the, the remit of the euro code. That's a complicated yeah. issue. Um, we, know, we know that if, if you've got uh, non-associativity, then you don't necessarily get a unique solution and you can get oscillations in your results. So um, I think that's one where it's it's down to the, the user of the model to know how to use that best and to interpret those results. And from France, um, are there any recommendations related to constitutive models where strength is void ratio dependent, hypoplasticity, etc.? I think we are getting to a, to a, to a, an area where it's getting getting very soil model focused, which is uh, which is not part of what we are so we are trying to get to. Um, well, the, the Eurocode 7 cannot substitute the yeah. expertise yeah. Yeah. in numerical analysis and the, yeah. the knowledge of the modeler. So that's not the intent to give a detailed yeah. guidance. Otherwise, we will need yeah. hundreds and hundreds of pages just on the section on numerical methods. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So no, it doesn't go in that detail to separate yeah. between different types of advanced constitutive model to give separate guidance for those. No. Yeah. Um, Again, okay, the next one is creep time. If we have a time-dependent constitutive model creep, how would this approach be applied? Yeah, it's yeah, same sort of questions, but right? about different types of constitutive models. Uh, from Ronald, there is always a lot of discussion about applying partial factors or strength reduction in undrained layers. Uh, sometimes applying strength reduction in combination with undrained behavior leads to a uh, factor less than one, even if the initial situation is stable. So this may lead to unrealistic safety factor. So this be done rather than undrained then? What are the recommendations of the presenters at this point? Well, I mean, you usually, if you if you if you factor your soil strength, then you 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 are unable to run your model um, to convergence. It's either the, the whole system is not stable, or the algorithm doesn't 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 um, 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 or there are some numerical so problem in the algorithm. I mean. Some of the model that I run, you see displacements of um, five millimeters, and then it says soil collapse, and those are those are potentially numerical issues within the within the software. And if if you really when you run it, and then you you don't get convergence, and and then 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 possibly uh, the whole system is not stable. 
So I would say that, I mean, if you really can't get the factor of safety of more than one, after applying your factor, if you investigate your model and it is doing the right thing, but not able to get the convergence and you get the failure sort of mode happening in the model, it's likely that uh, you are not achieving your, 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 your partial factors or requirement. So, so you need to then make sure that you, you can get, get to, the, to the, you can change your design to get to your, your, your uh, convert, converged type of model. That is assuming that the model runs uh, in, in, in the sensible sort of way and you see that, yes, that is, there is a failure. There is a question from Richard uh, about the combination one. He was surprised was the critical for major retaining wall analysis that I encountered. Combination two would determine the design. Was limited equilibrium method or subgrade reaction method well, uh, used for the comparison? Well, I, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I use flu and I use uh, I use more advanced soil model. And then, as I said, Richard, I mean you could get combination two to govern depending on the soil type and depending on, depending on the construction uh, sequencing and all that. It doesn't mean that C1 always govern. That's why I, I, I've said that before. I mean, usually, I mean, from what I have seen, usually in Steve. Especially in the UK, yeah. Yeah, London Steve Clay, Clay, London Clay, and in, in more competent soil ground, combination one tends to govern. But uh, you you never know. It depends on what you what you are building, and if you are doing something very very uh, ambitious, and 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 for example, if you dig, exca you excavate, I mean, fifteen meters without without with a with a single prop at the top, or without without a prop at the top, then you might get C two to govern because the soil strength just being fully mobilized. So it's, it's not um, black and white sort of stuff. You need to confirm which is more critical and take it from there. Well, you need to do both. So you don't oh, yeah. need to second yeah. guess. So it yeah. doesn't really matter if it's the one or the other. You have to do both and you will find out. Yes. So, yes. yeah, it's not, it's not good to rely on previous experience and disregard one of the two. Yes, that's right. Um, Following up, the partial factors applied in the design of slopes using plexus, should strength reduction procedure be used then for slopes uh, stability analysis? I think that's similar to a previous question. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the code says you can also use limit equilibrium. Um, I think it depends on the numerical model and how you expect the, the soil to behave on its pathway to failure. Um, you may need to use strength reduction, but even then, um, it, it, it uh, just directly factoring it will probably give you similar results. Uh, it depends if the initial conditions are important. Guess <coughs> uh, um, about time, five o'clock. Yeah, yes, we have ten more open questions. What can we do? Can we follow up on them? Um, if uh, Colin and Yui have time enough to answer them, that's no problem for us. But I know that you will have to go to another meeting. Yes, yes, we need to finish sharp. Yeah. Um. So it's a question from uh, to you and Colin. Do you have some time to finish those questions? I'm 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 okay, but uh, yeah. Colin, I'm okay too. Yeah. yeah let's, okay. Let's, let's carry on then. Let's uh, carry on. Okay, but but I will have to leave because I have a work yeah. uh, meeting in two minutes. Yeah, so yeah. Thank, thank you, Georgios. Okay. Thanks, yeah, George. thank you very much, <laughs> Georgios. And thank uh, you, guys. Thanks, everyone. See you. Okay, thank you. Bye. So the next question is from uh, Darius. Do you know whether the required minimum values of the reliability of index beta as per EN nine nine zero are reached using? The new numerical modeling methods. The numerical uh, methods potentially allow the lower to lower the model error. Therefore, perhaps material factors could be reduced to keep the same reliability. I don't know for whom the question is, but I hope one of you <coughs> can answer it. So I, I'm I'm trying to work out the. I think the question is about is is it 
the question that if we use a numerical method, we have a more accurate result. So we got a lower model error and therefore the material factors could be reduced to keep the same reliability. So I think this is probably about model factors and there is uh, there are clauses in the code more detailed I think about model factors but I, I don't think there's any general guidance that you would get away with lower factors on a numerical model at present. I think that's uh, my perspective it's it's an evolving thing we've we've got to um, you know do more work looking at the relationship between numerical and model outputs and um, you know conventional limit equilibrium approaches and of course it's going to change which depending on the numerical model that you use so uh correct me if i'm wrong how i don't think there's any guidance that says <laughs> you can use lower right. factors with numerical methods okay you might be able to do that you might you might be justified in using a model factor mm. that's lower the guidance says you should use a model with an appropriate model factor that is ensures that you are conservative Yes. Okay, <laughs> but, but but more than that, I cannot say. Yes. And we can keep I it have, uh, for this. Yes. <laughs> can I add one one thing? thing um, a line or two. I'm basically, I mean, partial factor you you never get it to reduce, and model factor depending on who you talk to. Some some are saying that you use numerical modeling is a lot more risk in, in it because uh, because of the fact that I mean people are not comfortable with it and, and they might want higher modeling factor. So it's a, a double ages sort or what you call it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, for the next question, I, it's maybe a statement in the comparison of DA1C1 and DA1C2 in example, the finding covers the stability safety factor since it's, if I'm wrong, not only BM is compared. Um, of course, I mean the, the whole thing is uh, is uh, in in terms of the the, the 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 model that I have done. The stability, overall stability, is um, is is all is all uh, satisfied. I mean, I'm just outputting the the bending moment just as the uh, as the guidance of uh, the criticality of the design of the retaining structure. Yes, I mean I would say the overall safety. Stability factor of safety is uh, is uh, is covered there. Okay. And the next question is: Is there any special provision for material factor on strain weakening clay? Oh, sorry, I skipped one. Jump I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Strain weakening clay. I mean, it's basically this. This is the um, the. Uh, what do you call it, um, softening sort of behavior of the, 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 the ground. I mean, you, you pretty much, I mean, you do have, um, you do have a um, soil model that can handle um, uh, softening sort of behavior of, uh, of, of the ground. And you, if you have that model, you apply the partial factor, you, you go ahead and, and do your, your, your work. I mean, there's no, differences between 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 um, between um, or there's no difference in partial factor between different soil model if you so use soil model to do undrained sorts of calculation and then you rely on undrained shear strength is one point in calculation is 1.25 on tangent delta and if your model can handle strain softening then then you are covered there the unfortunate if your model cannot handle it, then you should be using it unless you factor it down to the so-called soft um, the residual strength as your as your soil model, but that, that won't won't be appropriate either. Okay. Then the question I skipped is the verification of structural forces and or anchor threats, forces and standard check in the VC three factors on soil strength. I would say so. Your 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 these two combinations. Your 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 you know saying there's uncertainty either on material properties or on structural um, for, or actions. So yeah. you have to check both. If the soil okay. is weaker than you expect, um, then you have to check that the fo that the structure can stand up with that weaker soil, basically. Yeah. Okay. 
Then the other question is, is there any advice for soft soil since if applied a material factor, the soil became very weak and may not stand, while in the real case, the slope and can stand who is you? I, I don't know if I say it correct, but I hope you understand the question. I think it means without, probably. It's shorthand mm -hmm. for without. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, so that is, that is the, the whole whole thing about um, um, managing risk in geotechnical soil design. The partial factor is there to protect, uh, protect situations where you do have uncertainties in the ground, and, and the factor is there to protect you. Yes, I mean, you can factor down the soil and then it doesn't stand up. Yes, I mean, that, 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 that has happened many times. Okay, then the next question is, what is, what is the verification procedure used to back analyze, analyze failure case and any lesson learned? Maybe yeah. the next statement is an agreement of uh, France, but... I don't quite understand where where that is going in terms of back analyzing failure case. I mean, you can back analyze a failure a failure by getting to a point where you know what is a failure that happens at the the the, the set strength. So you 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 only do that, and then then whether then you use that set strength to redesign your new structure. Then yeah, I mean that is your ultimate strength that you can back analyze. Yeah. Okay. Then from Ivan, as an example of retaining walls, calibrated 2D models, best performance against measures, used to be the one that assumed plane strain, strength parameters instead of three axial. It could be interesting to include some recommendations regarding the model boundary stress strain conditions for the representative of the terrific strength parameters, maybe? Oh, well, I mean, um, <laughs> it's I a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it, you are right. I mean, the, the um, triaxial test, I mean, the, according to my mentor, is, is, the, is, the, is, the, is, is the wrong thing to test the ground, but uh, that is where we are and, and a lot of, a lot of ground ground structure that we have doesn't follow triaxial. The plane strain, I mean, um, the plane strain, I mean, direct shears and extension compression, that sort of thing. But how do you test those big structure and, and to, to get all the mode of uh, deformation correctly represented in, in the lab? Not possible. So what you do is that you test it using triaxial and then calibrate it against, against uh, your soil model. And then when you do boundary value solve problem, you model your, 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 your structure, then you, if you have case history that measurements, then you can say that, well, I mean, yes, I mean, the, the direct source of uh, input from lab test results, it doesn't fit the, 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 um, the uh, measurements on site, then you calibrate, you, you try to improve the, the input parameters so that you get uh, so-called characteristic value that you're comfortable with. One-to-one -one sort of um, um, uh, input will never get you anywhere, especially triaxial to, to, to real life sorts of structures or performance. And all the researchers know that, I mean, you do single element sorts of tests, you never have that same parameters that represent sites sorts of measurement. Okay, thank you. Then next question, Euro provides factors on soil properties, uh, but it doesn't describe factors for young modulus. Can you please explain what factors to be taken in DA1C1 and DA1C2 on yeah. soil young's modulus? I mean, the, the factor that we apply is, is only on the strength parameters, not even the density. So it's only cohesion and friction. There is no recommendations on factoring strength. I mean, I included that stiffness of factoring was because in the past, I mean, when you have Celia 580 recommendation, there is a, a clause in all Celia retaining wall design guidance that, that says that um, because it factors the soil strength, the stiffness drops, hence you, you need to allow for some factoring of the, the stiffness. But since then, I mean, the new serial re revisions of 760, 
that has been taken out and there is no recommendations of, uh, of uh, factoring the stiffness in retaining wall design and, um, and I've included there was uh, part of the serial 580s of um, 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 uh, clause that requires or that recommend that you factor uh, stiffness as well. But I mean, no, I mean, current code, current Euro code, future Euro code has no guidance on, on factoring stiffness. We shouldn't be factoring it. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the audience, uh... I think uh, we will wrap up with those four questions now present, uh, because otherwise we are running uh, too far out of time, I guess. So I will start with the question. The VC trees for slope design, if soil reinforcement such as soil nail is modeled in slope, and am, am I right that resistance factor set R1 shall be applied to the soil reinforcement? Colin, do you know? That's, that's an interesting one. <laughs> I'd have to, I'd have to go back and, no. and look at that. So I, I think on on the wider question, um, it's interesting that, for example, things like anchors and nails, you might field test and you might get resistances measured directly, and it's good to apply those in the analysis. But you then end up with a hybrid kind of analysis where, with a numerical method, you're trying to apply factors to material properties or, or to actions. Um, so I'm afraid I, I don't have a uh, direct answer for that at the moment, but I can look into that in more detail. Okay, thank you. The next question is, are there recommendations regarding the design in seismic areas and how to do a numerical static calculation excursion to apply the safety potential factors out of EN 1998-5. That's a, that is a, a com complex one. I mean, in seismic soil design um, for retaining structure, for example, I mean, depending on how complex you want to make it, if you do a pseudo static type of um, uh, calculation, I mean, it's, um, you, is more straightforward in 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 in, uh, uh, in finite elements modeling. If you start to do dynamics based and you need to do time history and all that sort, of things gets a bit more complicated. Obviously, I think EN nineteen ninety eight requires you to design it as ultimate limit state, and meaning that you still need to have the full factor of safety. I believe. Okay, thank you. And last question. Sensitivity analysis as far as stiffness is concerned is probably the best tool to assess where we are with our results. So it's more a statement. Do you agree? Yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, it's the functions of um, how, how critical or what sorts of uh, um, 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 structure that you are modeling. And, and a lot of time, I mean, when you, when you, when you, um, um, design soil structure, soil interaction, you, 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 you provide stiffness to structural engineer. Once you get the right calibration, you say doubling, halving stiffness, you don't normally get a lot of difference in, in, in the design itself. So yes and no, depending on, on, on the, the ground, um, uh, ground problem that, or soil geotechnical problem that you're dealing with. I cannot give you a, uh, uh, an answer yes or no. <laughs> okay. I think sensitivity analysis is, is always a good idea, but not necessarily yes. always necessary. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, then with this last question, we came to an end of this webinar uh, with a lot of people uh, uh, registered, and I saw more than uh, 200 really attending uh, at this uh, live webinar. I will thank you both and also Georgia for your uh, presentations and your information. And uh, for the audience, we have recorded this webinar and it will be uh, sent to everyone who has registered. And it is also to be found on uh, several websites of ISMGGE and uh, from LEN and so on. So thank you all for attending and the people who are staying to the end, thank you for staying to the end. 
and hope to see you next time on the next topic of uh, Eurocode 7 webinars. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye.